Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to day two of the Virtual Flower Show 2021. My name's Martin Fish, and I'm with you this morning because we're going to have a gardening question and answer session. And our panel members here before you are all well-known exhibitors that you'll see at all the flower shows across the UK in normal times. You probably didn't see them last year, but hopefully they'll be back out on the circuit again later this year. But for now, we've managed to get them all here. All their lovely advice is here for you to... to pick on. So I will introduce them in no particular order. We've got Vicky Fox from Plantagogo, surrounded by lovely hookahs behind us. We've got Lynn Dibley from Dibley's, the houseplant specialist, and that looks like a lovely streptocarpus there, Lynn. Yeah. We've got Matt Soper from uh, Hampshire Carnivorous Plants, Alec White from Primrose Hall Peonies, Steve Hickman from Hoyland Plant Centre, and Rob Evans from Pheasant Acre. So that's the panel that we've got and we've had loads of questions in overnight <clears throat> so we'll get cracking with them and we're going to find out a bit more about growing plants from all these specialist growers again so in no particular order um alstromeria's a question here so i think this one might be for you alec um this is from somebody called uh why cycler um, and they would like to plant some alstrom areas in the garden, but they've been advised by a friend that they are very vigorous and will take over the garden. Um, they actually want them to grow them as cut flowers. So they're a little bit wary. So they want to know if all varieties are invasive um, and if they can plant them without them taking over the garden. So what do you think, Alec? Well, that's a good question. And it's a question that we get asked quite a lot. Um, the older varieties of Alstroemeria, um, Orantiaca uh, and, and such forth, um, the big tall orange ones, and um, you've got a yellow one as well, are great for cutting, but they really do run, particularly if you've got uh, very light soil. So if you've got light soil, I would definitely avoid those. But the, the newer cultivated varieties um, that you'll see around tend to um, clump up and they don't tend to spread. So uh, if you want a tall one, a yellow one, a good one for cut flower. Friendship is a good one. There's Evening Song, there's Pandora. There's lots of uh, varieties that, that get um, two foot six, three foot tall. So they make a good cut flower, but actually um, they're not going to run. Mostly in the garden centre, you'll find the dwarf ones, um, the intercancha varieties, <coughs> which are great for pops and things, but they don't get very tall. So they're not so good for cutting. So look out for the tall ones, yeah. I, um, I, uh, I grow one in my garden, which is called um, Indian Summer, um, which you do see in the garden centre, and it's probably a mid-height. It doesn't get to three feet, but it certainly gets to two feet, two feet. <coughs> and, and they do make brilliant cut flowers because they last for ages and ages in a vase, don't they? So yeah, they, really, they, they really do. And Indian Summer is particularly interesting because it has that wonderful dark bronze leaf with the orange flower, which is so different. So, um, yeah, that makes a really good cut flower. OK, Mike, thank you for that one, Alec. Um, moving over to Matt, because I think this is probably a, a Matt question. This is about Saracenia, and this comes in from Darren. Um, he wants to know, should he remove the flowers on his Saracenia? I think they're just starting to form at the moment. The reason he asks is because he's been told it helps to do it with the Venus flytrap. So he wonders whether he should also do it with his Saracenia. Yeah, um, it does help a lot with the Venus flytrap. The flower scapes about two foot long and it takes a lot of energy from the plant and so by removing the flower on a venus fly trap you get much bigger traps uh bigger leaves which is what you want the fly trap for it's a foliage plant for the saracenia we remove the flowers mainly because the flowers come up first followed by the pictures and when the pictures come up they sometimes get caught underneath the flowers and distort and bend so when we put a display on at the flower shows it's a foliage display to remove, re remove the flowers for that reason only. I don't find it makes any difference in the growth of the plant by removing the flowers. So if he likes the flowers, leave them on there. If, he, uh, if he's not that keen on them, remove them. It's entirely up to him, but it doesn't affect the growth of the plant. Yeah, because I think the flowers on a Saracenia are quite attractive, aren't they? You know, those biggish round flowers on a stalk. I think I'd leave them. I leave them on mine, to be fair. Yeah. But but, you, but basically what you're saying is it's your choice. It's not going to harm the plant. No, I mean, the, one, the ones that stay on the nursery that don't go to flower shows, they've all got their flowers on them. It's only the ones we take. So when we get round to Chelsea, we remove them all because they're a little bit tired compared with the foliage. I mean, it's an added bonus. You get really nice flowers and nice foliage. There aren't many plants that do that. So, um, yeah, I'd leave them on there, I would personally. 
Okay, right, there you go. That's your answer, Darren. It's entirely up to you, but um, yeah, that's the advice from the top man there. <coughs> right, Tommy G um, has sent a question in about hookahs. Um, well, he's got an area in his garden, quite a biggish area that's in dapple shade and he wants to plant ground cover. So he's, he loves hookahs. Um, and he's looking ideally for ones that are more spreading rather than sort of small compact plants. He wants something that is going to cover this area to give a, a dense ground cover. So are there any that are more suitable for that, Vicky, than others? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have trailing ones, which are only trailing because we put them, well, they're actually hookerellas, they're not hookerellas. Uh, they're a cross between a tearella and a hookera. Well, they're exactly the same thing, love exactly the same conditions, and they're great. They have quite long trailers on them. Um, and so, in, in effect, if, what they actually are is creeping ones that we've just all decided to put in a hanging basket, really, and call them trailers. So, it, they actually come from the um, the tiarella, the trailing tiarellas, uh, which creep around in the forest and everything that they're grown in, in North America. So, so, so they're, they're ideal and you get them in lovely colours as well. Every year there seems to be another new variety come out uh, of a trailing variety, which you can use as creeping. And, and they'll get to two to three foot spread on those uh, as well. There's also, there's also bigger hookers as well. You can get ones that are about three foot across um, like the Velosa types, such as guacamole and um, mega caramel and everything as well. So they cover a large area. But the nice thing about the, um, the trailing creeping varieties are, um, although they will root, they don't like sucker down. So if you suddenly change your mind and think, gosh, I want to get rid of these, you can just, you, you can take them out. You're not going to have a big jump on your hand to get rid of them. Okay, well, that's good. So they would give him that lovely carpet, like a forest carpet <clears throat> in this area, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, things okay. like Yellowstone Falls, Redstone Falls, uh, those sorts of varieties. If you look on, the, look on the website, it tells you all of those. So if you want to know a bit more, come with email. Yeah. I, I haven't come across the training ones before, Vicky. Vicky. So if you were doing a, a like a perennial hanging basket, would they trail down the side yeah. of a hanging basket or a wall manger? Yes, yeah, they'll get two to three foot trailers on them. They get a bit tatty after the winter. Um, and actually we suggest in the autumn just taking a little bit off the length. Um, two to three foot when they mature. They do take a, a couple of years to mature. Um, and, but they, they start trailing almost straight away. And if you get tatty at all, just take the scissors to them and just tidy them up. You know, you, you, can, take, you can take a foot off them if you want to. And it just makes them bushier. Okay. You know? They're really easy. Right here. And, and where would he get these from? Yeah, well, funnily enough, as you need okay. <laughs> to get them. <laughs> right. so on your website. Jolly good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Vicky. Good. Right. We've got a question about house plants. I'm looking at Lynn there with her um, streptocarpus. This is from um, Jean. And Jean says she remembers her grandma growing a plant and she th it had pretty flowers. She used to grow them on the windowsill. She thinks it was called a hot water plant. And she wants to know if, if that is right. And if so, are they easy to grow? And how do you grow them? And why are they called a hot water plant? Yes, they are achimenes, which uh, are a related plant to Streptocarpus, and they grow through the spring and summertime and then die back for the winter. And they die back to little rhizomes. They're, they're sort of like generally about two to three centimetres long. They look like little white or brown maggots almost. Um, and the theory was in the Victorian times that you needed hot water to get them growing again in the spring. So that's where they got the common name from, the hot water plant. But basically you just need to plant them, the rhizomes again in the springtime and they come back again once the temperature in the pot's about 15, 16 degrees centigrade. Right. Hence the what so, hot I mean, water presumably was it to get them started? Yeah, I mean, what you can do, you can put them in like a, a warm airing cupboard just as, until the sprouts start showing and then put them on the windowsill. But if you put them, st try and start them on a cool windowsill, they will be very slow. So you do need warmth to get them going. And then once they start growing, they grow into like uh, bushy plants uh, with tall stems. 
generally about 30 to 40 centimetres in height. And they have colours of flowers uh, from pinks, whites, yellows, purples. They're, they're quite a broad range of varieties in there now. Yeah, I, I remember we used to go and when I was uh, an apprentice on the park, <laughs> because the little rhizomes look like little maggots, don't they? Mm, yeah, yeah, e easily to be confused with um, something like vine weevil mag uh, mm. grubs as well. So you have to be a bit careful, because also if you do have vine weevil around, um, they will go through something like the um, rhizomes in the pots through the winter time. So your best in the autumn, as the plant dies back, take the rhizomes out of the compost, store them frost free for the winter in a dark place, um, and then re-sow them late springtime once it starts warming up again. Okay, lovely, right. So look out for those. And again, I'm sure they'll be available on, on a, a website to house plant specialists near yeah. you, won't they? Good. Yeah, right, thank you very it, much. <clears throat> Jolly good. Right, um, question here from Pete Wilkinson uh, about clivias. Um, and it's, it's a very sh short question to the point. Why won't my clivia flower? I've had it four years and never a flower. I want you to know, Steve, this is a genuine question. It's not one I've made up because look, I've just got my clivia here. <laughs> so it, it's not me asking this question on behalf of somebody else. So mine is in full flower. So why isn't this clivia from Pete Wilkinson flowering? What, what might you be doing wrong after four years to get no flower? Right, a simple answer as well. Clivias are the same family as the Agapanthus, Amarilla Dacey. And we all know that Agapanthus do flower initially better if the pot bound. The same with the clivia. The clivia likes to be underpotted rather than overpotted. So pot them on every two years into acidic compost, very well drained, and, and leave them. Don't be tempted to pot them into too big a pot. That's the first thing. But the two main things is in the autumn time between September and October, they do like a cold spell of about eight to 10 week below 10 degrees. So if you're growing clivias in your house, take them outside onto a shady uh, patio or somewhere in the garden under a tree, bring them in before the frost and give them a bit of a chill. That will set the bud in the base for flowering in spring. Keep them on the very dry side, December, January, that's the resting period. And then come February, start keeping them moist, which is watering probably once, twice a week, depending how warm your room is and uh, start to feed. Uh, the feed is quite important. Uh, your cold spell puts the bud in the base, the feed brings the stem up above the foliage and it flowers well. If you don't feed properly, it often flowers in the center of the rosette of leaves and you can't see it or it's not bother flowering at all. And, and that's it in a nutshell, really. So it may be, we, we don't know, we can't ask Pete, but it might be that if he's been growing them in a warm house all through the year, they're not getting that chill, which is initiating yeah. flower bud. So, uh, and, you must, and you must feed, yeah. Okay. Uh, feed the general purpose feed, uh, good balanced house food, slightly on the higher potash side, and, and you can't go wrong with them. They really thrive on the from in the sunshine, a shade of windowsill or in your room where ivies uh, or ferns grow is ideal. And okay, if you want further, right. in, further in information on our website, something for the garden. Okay, because you are a bit of a specialist in Clivia. You've got, have you got the national collection, Steve, now? Yeah, yeah. I thought Yeah, you we've had. got probably about 10,000 Clivias. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> okay. Jolly good. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right. The only person that's not asked the question in this first round is Rob. So uh, it's your turn now, <laughs> Rob. So this is because um, you, you grow all types of bulbs and, and dailies, but this is about gladioli, yes. which I know is something right. that you specialise <clears throat> in. Um, this is from, uh, I haven't actually got a name for this one. I do apologise, but it's, uh, they want to know when is the best time to plant, plant gladioli corms because they want them to flower in late August for a family occasion. So they want to try and get their timing right. I right. Uh, now I don't know whereabouts they are in the country either. So that probably doesn't help. So that, there's a little dip. just an idea on gladioli is when they're purchasing corms, you want to get a corm, a decent size corm to start with the flower late in the season. Now, smaller corms flower quicker. 
It's surprisingly, if you, the smaller the comb you plant, the earlier they'll flower. They'll flower in about 90 days. But to get flowers for the end of, end of August, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. You want to be planting around about the second week of May because the ground is a lot warmer at that time. And once the comb breaks through the ground and germinates up through the ground, hopefully if we've got normal conditions and we've got nice sunny weather, the only thing is make sure that they water well just before the sheath is coming through. So feel in the stem. Normally you've got seven or eight leaves on the spike itself and you'll feel the flower stem coming up through the middle. It's like a swelling between the leaves. And when that's there, that's when they need to water. So that's normally around about a month before you think about the flowers. So that's an ideal time then. But the best time for planting gladioli is, is from about the middle of April till the end of May to get a sequence of flowers from the beginning of August right the way through till the end of September. Right. So it might be worth doing that as well, rather than just exactly them all in one go, staggering it over a few weeks. So there's always going to be something in flower. For we have this year, we have a customer who's got two weddings. Unfortunately, he said he got two daughters and they're both getting married. He said <clears throat> one the beginning of August and one the beginning of September. And he's bought 200 gladioli combs and he's hoping to get them all in flower for both weddings. So. He's planted from, as I told him, start planting the middle of May and go right the way through till the end of, uh, uh, sorry, the middle of April until the end of May. And he should get flowers for both weddings. Good. That's good. Oh, well, good advice there. Uh, what might be nice to do, just suddenly thought, um, you know, people are watching this at home. Uh, it's got your names on the screen and I've introduced you, but it might be nice if you just give a little bit more information. We can start with you, Rob, as you're on at the moment. Tell us what pheasant acre grows what do you do it at the shows at the shows we specialize in gladioli and dahlias uh through the the summer shows and then through the shows through the spring we are specializing in tulips and bulbous plants and this is one of the pots of tulips that we normally sell at the shows and as you can see now beautiful pot there this variety <clears> actually <throat> is a very very dark uh maroon color it's called paul sharer now as you can see, five bulbs in a one litre pot and it's flowering roughly about a foot in height. Now, this is one a very good variety for going in the garden. It's a repeat flowering. It'll come back year after year. And as long as you are feeding all your tulips and especially any bulb that's left in the ground, they need to be fed on a regular basis and always feed once you see the flower bud forming because that at that time is when the bulb is at its weakest. So that's when it needs to be fed, ready to build the bulb up for the following season. So at this time of year now, all our tulips are in flower and we're planting gladioli out in the field. We're also starting our dahlia tubers off, but also at this time of year now, while I've been sitting, I've just taken a couple of little dahlia cuttings, as you can see there on my palm of my hand and we are taking those now and their plants will those cuttings will root in about 10 days and those will be plants that will form tubers for next year but cuttings will flower this year from about the middle of august onwards so it's always a busy period people say to me oh you have a quiet time on the nursery very rarely do we have a quiet time because we're either planting bulbs taking cuttings or planting out in the field or cutting flowers. Yeah, so it keeps you busy all year round. Yes. Absolutely. Good. All right, thanks for that. Um, Matt, tell us about Hampshire carnivorous plants. I know you've answered a question about Saracenias, these lovely insect eating plants, but tell us just a bit more about your business. Well, we're Hampshire carnivorous plants based down close to Winchester in Hampshire, the UK's largest carnivorous plant nursery and we sell plants from full tropical, subtropical and temperate from all parts of the world. And we specialise in mail order and we send them out you know, all over the UK, well, all over the world actually. So um, we just specialise in carnivorous plants, that's what we do. And we also sell them at flower shows when the flower shows are on. <laughs> And, and are they, because they, they seem very exotic and, you know, people look at them and think, oh, I, I don't think I'd be able to grow those. But I mean, Saracenia, for example, is mm. probably one of the easiest and it, it's hardy, isn't it? 
Yeah, they are. A lot of them look very exotic and tropical. I did mention before we sell tropical and temperate. The tropical ones are mainly the Nepenthes pinguicula and some of the more tropical drosera. But majority of carnivorous plants are temperate and, as you say, can be grown outside. They just look very exotic. Yeah. OK, so it's and again, you, you they can find you online to get more yep. information and things or see you at shows when they open up. That's great. Yeah, the website is uh, www.hansflytrap.com and you'll see a, a huge range of plants there. Oh, brilliant. OK, thank you, Matt. Uh, moving along, uh, who can I see next on my screen? Lynn Dibley. Dibley's, of course, it's a name that people have known for a long, long time. So what do you grow at Dibley's, Lynn? Right, well, we started off, we specialised initially with Streptocarpus. Um, and this is Streptocarpus falling stars, which is one of the, the mainstays of the varieties we take to the flower shows. It's a really good flowering variety, flowers for at least six, eight months a year. Um, and it just has masses of blooms. And the good thing about Streptocarpus, once they start flowering in the springtime, and I've had this on my windowsill in the house, so it started just naturally in early April, um, it will carry on and you just take the flower buds off mm -hmm. as they're going off and um, and then they, they just keep going on and on and on all through the summer but also once we started doing the streptocarpus we then moved on to other related plants to streptocarpus that grow in the same conditions so they're all under glass um, and likewise <coughs> that's why we had the kimonies the hot water plants they grow in similar conditions and then there's other plants that the same family that's so little known in effect in the UK but this is a relation and this is Nematanthus. Uh, this particular variety has fantastic variegated foliage green and yellow and it's really shiny and glossy and the flowers on it are orange which is a quite unusual flower for the Gisneriad family which is the family that Streptocarpus are in and these are shaped, if you could see it, like a clog, and they get a common name, the clog plant. Um, so that is a really fantastic plant, and it flowers practically the year round. So we grow all sorts of um, plants related to Streptocarpus, and then also we do a lot of the foliage begonias. Uh, we grow probably in the region regularly about 80 different varieties of begonias. And we sell them out to the garden centres and then we do an awful lot with mail order as well. So we have a, a website which you can buy any of these plants online from us as well. OK, there you go. So full range. And you're, you're based in North Wales, of course, aren't you? Yeah. OK, right. Moving up the screen to Steve. He was just stroking his dog a few minutes ago, came in for a quick cuddle. Steve, tell oh. us about Hoyland Plant Centre. You've already said you grow clivia, but what else do you grow? Uh, well, we, we mainly specialise in uh, Agapanthus. That's what we're sort of well known for at the flower shows. Uh, but we do a lot more sort of Amaryllidaceae sort of plants. The Agapanthus, the Nerine, the Amarine, the cousin of the Agapanthus, the Tulbagias. Uh, my latest interest the last few years has been Clivias and uh, Misunders, a few dioramas. Uh, we mainly do the flower shows when they're on. We do lots of mail order. Uh, we do talks up and down the country. We're situated just up Junction 36 in South Yorkshire, just north of Sheffield, just south of Barnsley. The foothills of the Pennines, as we call it, uh, God's own country. <laughs> um, and that's as it really, in a nutshell, we've been going about 36 years. Uh, there's me, Elaine, um, there's now my son, Colin, uh, and my youngest daughter, Heather. And the four of us make up oil and plant centre. And, and you, that really is uh, a nutshell. And you've got a garden uh, as well, as we've just seen. Well, we've got Burren, the, the black Labrador's asleep on the settee. OK. So. <laughs> totally good. Right, well, I hope to see you to show soon. Uh, moving up to the top of my screen, we've got Alec there from Primrose Hall. Um, so tell us, Alec, uh, I'm guessing your pin is from the picture behind you. Yeah, we're uh, Primrose Hall Peonies. We've actually got two brands, Primrose Hall Peonies and uh, more recently the Paragol Alstroemeria brand, which has got a really long history in this country. Um, so we grow, we specialise in peonies and Alstroemeria. They're the only things we grow. We're in Bedfordshire, 
got about eight acres. We grow peonies in the field um, and in containers. We've got about 380, 400 um, varieties um, of peony and about 230 odd, 250 varieties of Alstroemeria in commercial production. Um, we sell at the flower shows when they're on and online, um, www.primrosehallpeonies.co.uk. Um, and uh, yeah, we supply the RHS as well. I think there's a little bit of wholesale going on. So um, we're a family business. We've been going for about 12 years now. Um, and uh, we're going to have some open days later on this year. So later on in May and in June. So look out for those. You'll be able to come have a look at the peonies growing in the field. Hopefully they'll be in flower, but at the moment, they're not very big at all. They've been held back a bit by the cold weather. Okay. Thank you. And that's put by no least. Um, we've got Vicky Fox from Plantagogo. So, Vicky, tell us a bit about your business. Okay. Well, we have plantagogo.com and um, we specialise in hookera, hookerella, and tiarella. Uh, the nursery has been going over 31 years. It's been going a bit long, but officially 31 years. Um, I grew up on a nursery. So you must have started the nursery then when you were a child. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> You're very oh. kind. Thank you. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> but um, I, mean, I grew up on a nursery, so we've grown all sorts of things. Um, uh, Richard and I, there's just Richard and I on the nursery, and we have a friend who helps us do some packing. So it's quite a full on thing. Uh, we've got a passion for Hooper, Hooperella, and Tierella, but we also love lots of other perennials. We get we go off at a tangent, a little bit like Steve, really. We go off at a tangent occasionally when we kind of get a bit of a passion for something else, and we seem to collect a load of those, and then we sell those, like Nipophias at the moment. We're quite keen on the dwarf varieties, the pop. Series. I like a few auriculars, you know, so we have a few other little things going on there. We've got the National Collection of Hooper, Hooperella and Tierella, and um, we, we, we sell at the shows uh, online, of course, uh, which we've been getting, the online uh, business has been going since 1999, so it's quite a long time, quite well established, um, and uh, we also are opening, the, we don't always open the nursery up but we're opening it by appointment just because we're only, we're only small not a lot of parking and everything and we want to keep it safe for everybody so if you go on the website people are very welcome to book a visit and you get sort of like an hour for your party um whatever government allows at the time uh, we do we love the shows we do the shows when they're on <laughs> and um yeah, uh, we, we grow a lot of companion plants as well to go with them. And we like to encourage people to grow them in different ways, in pots and in the borders, um, you know, um, vertical walls. You can put them on walls and things like that. So lots of different things that they can put them. Excellent. And the only one thing you've missed out there is of all the things you do is gin. Because oh. I know gin, you do like the odd glass of gin, don't you? I've seen that. When I have that. a little collection of gin too. That's Fortunately, it. I'm not very good at growing it or distilling it. So no. I leave that to somebody else. <laughs> but I'm told by Richard, you're very good at drinking it. Um, before we move <laughs> on and do more questions, you, you've mentioned several times you grow hookah, tyrella and hookahella. We have, we've actually got a question from John. <coughs> Yeah, who it's basically the question is, what is the difference between hookera, tyrella and hookerella? as I get confused? So could you in a nutshell explain the difference? Yes. Yeah, there isn't a lot of difference uh, visually between that, that a lot of people would notice between hookera and hookerella. There's a big difference between the tiarella. Um, what the hookerella is, I'll start with that first. The hookerella is a cross or a hybrid between the hookera and the tiarella. And the reason for doing that is to bring in all the uh, different shapes and colors from the two genus. So the tiarella are green predominantly. And if I just lean to one side, you can see this one green one in the middle with the markings, the picture behind me. Uh, that's tiarella emeraldelli. And it's got lots of dissected foliage and um, and lots of nice barring in the middle, but they're nearly all green with maroon or black or, and they have lots of little starry flowers. So they're gorgeous for that as well. And um, the hookra, which are mainly on this poster here next to it, with all the colored foliage there, uh, 
they've got lots of vibrant colour, but their leaf shape is largely the same. Some are ruffled, but their leaf shape isn't dissected at all. And the markings tend to be veining, not really splodges in the middle or anything like that. So then when you cross the two together, you get this, if you look at this uh, picture behind me, the yellow and red one, that one is a hookerella, and that one's got dissected foliage, colourful in the middle, and, and a different colour on the outside. So you're bringing all the colour in from the hookera, all the leaf shape in from the tearella, and you get an added bonus with the hookerella that you get a cross with the flower as well. So the, the hookera flowers are bells, a common name is coral bells, uh, but when you cross it with the tearella, you get a, a bell shaped back from the flower and a little starry center. And that's actually sometimes the only thing that tells you that it's a hookah because you don't always get the dissected foliage on the hookahella. Okay, thank you very much. That's good. Um, right, we'll get on with some other questions. I'm going to come back to you all later just for sort of top tips on your specialist plants. So think of a, a top tip that we can pass on. Um, but I've got a question now for Matt. Uh, Matt, um, this comes from somebody called Matthew. So this is even more, it's not you asking yourself, is it? But uh, <laughs> Matthew would like to ask Matt, can you explain how to divide a pot bound Saracenia and when should I do it? Right, um, they like to be restricted, as Steve was saying about the clivias, they really do. You get your biggest pictures when they're restricted. So firstly, I'd make sure that the plant has been there long enough. So if it's been in there three or four years and it's really pushing, if it's a plastic pot out of shape, what I would do with it is take it out, get a, a slightly larger plastic pot, <clears throat> only about an inch or two bigger. If it was in a, a five inch, get a, probably a seven inch, put some compost in the bottom, pop it on and pot it on. If you really want to divide it up, now is the right time to do that. Take it out of its pots. They're rhizomous plants and they divide. But the problem with carnivorous plants, where they get most of their food from the insects they catch, they normally have a very meagre root system. So make sure that each part of the rhizome that you want to divide has roots on it. You invariably find that one of the rhizomes will be completely devoid of roots and all the roots are another part. So first thing, take it out, strip all the compost away from the roots, Check there's at least three or four roots on each part that you're going to divide. And you can use a hand saw if you need be, just to cut them up, separate them off, plant them up with the rhizome at soil surface, like an iris. And I really do pack them in well. I use a compost of peat and perlo and stand them back in a water tray and away you go. But personally, I like to pot them on each year. So you've got a nice big plant with lots of pictures on them. They look fantastic. When you do divide them up, you will find it does knock them a bit. And the first season, you won't get so many pictures on them. So personally, I like to pop them on. If you do want to divide it up, now is the right time and make sure there are roots on each part. So if, if you don't want more plants, then there's no point dividing. As you say, just keep going bigger and bigger and then you'll get yeah. a specimen plant like we'd see on your exhibit. at it, it, Exactly. That, that's what a lot of people like. Yeah, a nice big specimen, about 20 or 30 pictures. They look absolutely spectacular. They really do look good. So that's personally, that's what I like to do with them. And they could do that at this time of the year. Perfect time to do it, yeah. And uh, yeah. You, you talk about the compost. Any particular compost that they need? Yeah, we sell a compost com one on our website. It's very good for them. That's what we use for all our display plants at Chelsea. We had 21 consecutive golds there, so we've got a good mix that we use, yeah. and I'd recommend that one. So you're not going to tell us what's in it. It's a special. It's, it's got peat and some other ingredients and sharp yeah. sand and what have you. Because there is but a no, debate about good. using peat, but Saracenias yeah. won't grow in a peat-free compost, will they, at the end of the day? Um, I don't want to talk too long about it, but yeah, you can get away with it. The problem is, is where we stand them in rainwater. And a lot of the alternatives to peat, when you stand like a wood-based or a coir based one, when you stand that in water, it rots and turns to mud quite quickly, whereas peat with its nature from a peat bog holds yeah. its structure for years. And we've got some plants that have been in the same compost for five or six years. Sphagnum moss is a good alternative, which has now become more readily available. And you can use sphagnum moss, but it's not quite so uh, sturdy as peat and they can, the taller varieties can fall over when potted in sphagnum. So, um, there are a few alternatives about, but you have to pot annually rather than every three or four years. 
Right. OK, lots mm. of tips there. Thanks, Matt. That's great. Uh, OK, moving on to um, Lynn for a question here. Uh, this is from Lizzie. Um, Lizzie wants um, to grow a pot plant begonia. Uh, ideally, she's a bit, a bit of a wish list here. Ideally has lovely foliage and flowers, but she'd also then like to be able to take it out in the summer and use it in a container outside. Uh, does such a plant exist and if so can you give any suggestions yes there's a few you could use <clears throat> um generally you want some of the shrubby varieties that have got good color on the foliage so something like little brother montgomery which has got a, a dark green gray and silver gray foliage they have flowers on and off throughout the summer none, none of the Colourful foliage varieties tend to have an awful lot of flower. Um, then there's another variety called Dark Eyes uh, <clears throat> that has a dark foliage and silver again with more of a pink tinge and that has pink flowers. And these are shrub varieties that tend to grow to about two and a half foot high. And they look really good um, outdoors. You can put them in a border in part shade and you'll have those and they grow really nicely outside for up until about end of October, I found up, up here in North Wales. Um, but you will have flowers on those and you will have attractive foliage because also they've got uh, serrated foliage. Um, it's slightly palmate shaped. So that's attractive in itself, even without the flowers. OK, and then obviously when it cools down in the autumn, she just bring it back in and carry on growing it as a house plant. Exactly, yeah. Repot it if, you, if you've taken it out of the pot and then, yes, keep it indoors on the slightly dry side through the winter. OK, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, right, question for uh, Rob. This is from Barry. Barry, you touched on the fact that you grow uh, dahlias as one of the things you grow. And I think you said you're busy taking cuttings at the moment. Uh, Barry wants to know when he can plant his tubers. He's got some tubers. I think they must be new by the sound of it. When can he plant them in the soil? And can they then stay in over winter to save him having to lift them? And he has said he lives in South Yorkshire. So Steve might know. Do you know anybody called Barry? <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, so when can he plant them? And um, you, you know, can he leave them in permanently? Right, now this is a typical tuber, as you can see here, that we uh, send out in the post. And uh, you know, our mail order this year for daily tubers has gone wild. We had to stop taking orders quite early on this year, and we're still sending out daily tubers now. But planting daily tubers, heated greenhouses and heated beds, you can start them off in the middle of February, early March. But if you want to plant them directly into the garden soil, then what you should be doing is to pocket plant. So dig out a nice hole uh, about 8 to 10 inches deep, incorporate some nice humus in there, some old rotted manure. Never use fresh manure on dahlia tubers because you'll get plenty of foliage, but very little flower that first year. Because, and especially now with all the manure that's coming out, they, instead of using straw in the manure, they're using wood chip. And it's obviously now taking the nitrogen out of it to break down itself. So what we find is get your manure this year for using in maybe two years time and make some good compost heaps. But planting your dahlias then, you plant your nice humus into the ground and then plant your tuber about two inches below the ground surface. And then, but that is, you know, now from the middle of April on is ideal for planting direct into the soil. This week we've had, so we've had frost every morning this week and, you know, little trials, we put the odd dahlia outside to see what the temperature is going to be like coming the next morning, completely black. So that's what will happen. So make sure that throughout April and May, if the tuber has shot and it's above the ground surface, is to cover it over with some fleece or some straw to protect the new shoots because they're very, very soft. The other thing to watch out for when the dahlia tuber is just emerging from the ground are our friends, the slugs because there's nothing better than a young shoot of dahlia that is full of water for the slug to come along and take the top straight off. So again, make sure that you can put something around there, some crushed cockle shells or egg shells, they're great. Now, 
over the last couple of years, we've been using strulch. Uh, we've topped the pots with it and we put it out on the beds itself. And we have found that it has reduced our problem with slugs by up to about 70%. So that's ideal as well to use. Uh, so at this time of year, getting the dahlia tubers in now and you know, plenty of fertilizer on them, liquid feeding, foliar feeding right throughout the season, that will help encourage more growth and give you brighter and stronger blooms throughout the summer. Okay, and, and just touching on um, South Yorkshire, do you, would you advise him to lift the tubers? I would lift, we lift all our tubers every year. We, you know, it's, uh, you know, this year the ones that were left in the ground, I would think uh, will now be mush, unfortunate. Mm -hmm. We've got some that, uh, you know, we left in pots and the indoors in cold greenhouses this year have been frosted and they've already gone out. Um, I think, you know, depending on your soil conditions, if you've got light sandy soil, you know, you can leave them in the ground. But I don't think Yorkshire has any light sandy soil anywhere, Steve, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, it's, um, it's very similar to Wales, wet and windy and, uh, you know, very heavy clay soil. So lift the dahlia tubers every year and yeah. wait until, you know, we lift ours now around about the end of October, early November. We leave them dry off for about six to eight weeks before storing them for the winter. And importantly, is take as much of the soil off that's around the tubers. And, you know, lots of people over the winter, they keep them too warm. They need to be just frost free. So, you know, and fleece is great. If you've got big tubers, get the fleece and get it in between the tubers on the, on the root system itself. That helps then as well, stopping any of the botrytis and any rot coming into it because if you can part the tubers a little bit because what you've got to remember is the tuber is the store and looking on that one there the shoots only come from the top of the tuber they don't come off the tubers themselves they only come from the crown where the tuber is attached to the stem so you can see there that one that's where the shoot is coming from, not off the tubers. Mm -hmm. good, good explanation there, because we all think of a potato as a tuber, and that has yes. shoots all over, because that's a stem tuber, but what you're looking at there is a root tuber. Root tuber, it? Very, yes. very different. So good good answer there. Uh, and what's that, you on, know, the, on the website, on our website, we give good instructions for lifting. So go on to it September, October time, but go on to it any time <laughs> of the year. You need to look at anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've got videos how to lift the tubers and how to clean the tubers and how to store them over the winter. So that's on the website, which is www.pheasantacreplants.co.uk. Brilliant, Rob. Thank you. And yeah, anybody watching, um, you know, that's the, the good thing about talking to specialist growers. They know their plants inside out. Steve, uh, you're down in South Yorkshire. I'm up in North Yorkshire. We've got lovely, friable, sandy loam where we are. So, you know, you <laughs> pick the wrong part of the county. Uh, right. Moving on. Uh, Alec, um, question for you. Um, can you suggest any peonies that have scented flowers? Oh, crikey. Um... I didn't well, know they have scented flowers. Do the peonies have scented flowers? Well, that's interesting. A lot of people uh, are not aware that peonies are fragrant. There are loads and loads and loads of fragrant peonies, particularly the lactiflora um, varieties. I'd say almost 80% of the peonies that are now available are scented. <laughs> and um, it's really only some of the species ones and maybe some of the hybrids that aren't. Um, so the question is really, what kind of scent do you want? Um, it's a little bit uh, subjective, I guess, but um, there's said to be about five different fragrances with peonies. Um, you know, the, some of them are slightly lemony. That's probably the um, the tree peonies mostly, but there's sweet, um, there's a rose type scent, there's a musky type scent. So all different scents. Um, and some of them, of course, are slightly more fragrant than others. Um, at this time of year, one I really like is Claire de Lune. Um, Claire de Lune is lovely. It's a beautiful um, pale cream lemon coloured flower with a gorgeous, gorgeous sweet scent um, on a greeny, bluey kind of foliage. And it's quite lax. It makes a nice little shrub and it's very happy in, in a 
part shade position. So that gives a wonderful bit of scent at um, at this time of year. But there are literally hundreds and hundreds. Um, Sarah Bernhardt, of course, um, the very famous one, the pink flower, slightly later to flower, but um, that's gorgeously scented as well. But there are there are just so many. Um, one of my favourites is one called Katarina Fontin, which is a beautiful double blush pink um, peony on a really good stem. It makes a good cut flower, but it has a really, really strong scent, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, another one is Boule de Neige, which is a slightly smaller flower, snowballs, as the name would suggest, um, beautiful <coughs> double white cream flowers, but again, really heady, sweet scent. And if you walk through the um, polytunnels where we've got those growing, um, when they're in flower, it can really knock you over it's such a strong scent so have a have a look um we've got a whole section on our website just for fragrant peonies and so you can pick um all of our top tips um for fragrant peonies and, and choose the best ones there but there's there's lots and lots of them and of course they're slightly more fragrant in the morning um and and in the evening <coughs> the, the by the time the evening comes the scent sometimes it's dissipated a little bit um but uh, yeah okay lots of fragrance on peonies Right. Why they're a great cut flower. Yes, exactly. You do see them, don't you, now in these lovely sort of blousy country style informal arrangements. So uh, there you go. Get looking uh, for those. Um, I don't know who sent the question. There was no name. Um, right, Steve, I think this is for you. Um, this is from Victoria. And well, I know you'll be able to answer this one for us. Victoria has heard somebody talking on television about a plant called Society Garlic. Um, and she wants to know if you can actually eat it and what it is. Well, you, I know, grow society garlic, don't you? Yeah, well, society garlic is called Tobagia. Uh, the common one, what uh, Lady's referring to, will be uh, Tobagia violacea. Now, we don't recommend you use it in cooking, obviously, for legal reasons and allergies and things like this. But if you go on to... Uh, a lot of the cookery websites and listen to the uh, the famous cooks which are around. They do recommend uh, it flavours sort of filled the garlic taste. Uh, it's called society garlic because uh, back in the Victorian times, the Victorian cooks used to use it in the cooking. It used to flavour the food garlic. But the next morning, when the visitors were surfacing for breakfast, they didn't smell a garlic. It cleared, mm -hmm. but because only the rich could afford the facilities to grow the tobagia, it was called Society Garlic, and that, that's how it got its name. If you want more information about tobagias, and indeed Agapanthus uh, clivia, if you go to our website, www.somethingforthegarden, there's lots and lots of information in our contact details uh, mm -hmm. where you can pick up information which you really cannot get anywhere else and I think we do supply dozens of different uh, tool baggies in case people are interested in growing but yeah you, you can use it in cooking uh, in uh, Spain and the Mediterranean they also put the flowers and have the flowers actually on the plate as a garnish and you can eat the flowers as well we did have one customer I think he was at Chelsea a few years ago uh, what picked a tool bagger up and says oh these are nice, can I eat one? And we jokingly said, yeah, just as a joke. And she actually bit the flower off the top of the stem and ate it. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, well, there we go. She bought the plant, though, after. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was going to say, if it was on the display, I hope she did it after you were, after you were judged. <laughs> <laughs> I might have knocked me down a point there. <laughs> Good, OK. I mean, it is a lovely plant, isn't it? I, I, I've got some... The, more than likely came from you, Steve, years ago, and <clears throat> in nice <clears throat> pots, and they've made lovely clumps. And the thing about them, they've got these lovely, delicate, sort of violety, pinky flowers, and they flower from May right the way through till September. They just go yeah. on and on and on. But well, they have got that garlic scent if you crush the foliage. That's right. They, they don't all smell of garlic, and some of them are quite scented. And we, over the last few years, we've nashed our collection of uh, tobaggers as well with over 200 different ones. I think we've also got collection of national collection of Agapanthus and the Clivias. Uh, but we've bred a range called Beauty. It's the Hoyland series. 
there's, there's pink beauty, dark beauty, giant beauty, scented beauty. Uh, there's lots of different ones. And we should have launched Hoyle and Pink Beauty uh, last year at Chelsea, but obviously it didn't happen. It may happen this this autumn. Uh, we'll have to see. But that really, really flowers its head off. That's that's Hoyle and Pink Beauty, our new one. Okay, brilliant. Right. Okay. okay. Um, we've got just over ten minutes left, so we'll try and rattle through a few, through a few more questions. And, and if you've got any tips, I will ask you for those in a minute. Um, this is a question from Mary about streptocarpus. Mary's tried to go in streptocarpus, uh, but they struggle and wilt in her sunny conservatory. Um, she wants to know if she's doing something wrong or is it a pest or a disease that's just causing them to, to flop. Um, Lynn, growing them in a sunny conservatory, what's going wrong? Probably too hot. Uh, streptocarpus are woodland plants. Um, they grow, even though they come from South Africa, they grow in the woodland where it is actually quite cool. Um, probably the, a hot conservatory isn't the best place unless you've got plenty of shading in there. Um, it would tends to be, if they do wilt, they will wilt during the daytime when it's hot. Leave them and they'll come back in the cool evening and they'll sort of perk back up again. The, the one thing uh, people do tend to do is if they've wilted when it's too hot and they go to water the plants, they can overwater them and the plant will start, the roots will start rotting. So that it is quite a, um, a problematic place to put the plants. Um, best, if you have a hot conservatory, put the plants near the floor where it's coolest or back near the house wall where it's cooler and there's more shade. And then they don't tend to do that wilting because of heat. Um, it, it won't harm the plant overall, but if you have to keep the plants there and you've got nowhere else, don't water them when they're wilted. Wait until the following morning and then see if the pot compost is dry on the surface, then give some water. But that's the one thing with streptocarpus, they don't like getting too wet. So if it's too hot, wait until the next day and see if they need watering then. Okay, lovely. Thank you for that one. Uh, Vicky, this is just a general one about um, hookahs. Um, this one is from uh, Eddie, uh, and Eddie wants to plant some. I don't know whether Eddie's a lady or a gentleman, but wants to plant some. But they know that some hookahs prefer slightly different conditions. And I think they're probably referring to the fact that, you know, the, the very pale leaf ones don't like as much sun because they scorch and probably better in shade and vice versa. But she's wanting to know how to know generally, are there any tips if she wants to plant several, will they be compatible and grow together? Um, you know, how, how can you help in that way? Just give her a few tips. Right. Well, like you said, the pale leaf hookera um, and, and all the tiarella and all the hookerella will all grow in shade, part shade. Um, so, you know, the, the lime greens, the yellows, the golds, those sort of colours always in the shade can't go in the sun anyway but we we've actually on our website if you go to plant a go go website you will see that we've put some collections together for people we've got a lot of um garden people who are new to gardening and we were finding that people had a bit of trouble choosing so we decided to put some collections together to help people so like got the shady collection and things like that and then once they've got a feel for that they can sort of move on from there uh, of course, they could always um, ask, you know, send an email, have a question thing there. Um, and we have a newsletter as well that we could join to, which we talk quite a lot about plants for the shade. But that's, that, that is the easiest thing, is the colour of the foliage is, is a sort of broad tip, really. And the hooperella and the tearella for shade. OK, that's good. Thank you very much. Um, Rob, um, just general tips, what way to plant, this is this um, is a question, what way to plant bulbs? Because sometimes it's not obvious which is the top and which is the bottom. And have you got any tips on planting depth? Because it varies again, doesn't it? Planting depth on most bulbs is normally two and a half times the size of the bulb. <clears throat> but for instance, on our gladioli, we plant these about six inches deep. So when you think the gladioli is, so turn some of the bulbs, if they're flat bulbs, turn them on their side. That'll give you a better idea. Like for instance, anemone blander. People, when they buy anemone blander in the autumn, when they see them, they're shriveled up. 
if they soak those bulbs overnight in some water, they'll double in size. So that then will soften the bulb and it'll help them grow a lot quicker. But also, it'll give you a better idea of a depth to plant them. So when you see them like that, tulips, for instance, the species tulips, very small bulbs, you know, they only need to be planted about two and a half to three inches deep. But if you want to naturalize them and they're going to come stay in the ground for year after year and come back, you need to plant them a little bit deeper. So you plant them about three to four inches deep. Now, the variation in bulbs and corms, corms grow on top of the one you plant every year. So crocosmias, your crocus, they're all going to produce a new corm every year. So the one you plant originally shrivels up and dies. The new one is formed on top. It's a swelling of the stem. So obviously it's going to come closer to the surface of the soil every year. So that's why every two or three years you should lift crocosmia, divide them. The same with crocus, lift them, clean off all the old ones and then replant because what happens is they get closer to the surface every year with frosts with the crocosmia and the gladioli is over the winter. They'll get frosted with the crocus. They'll get dried out in the summer and shrivel up and also the squirrels will get them. So on a variation, look at the size of the bulb. Normally <clears throat> two and a half times the depth of the bulb. Certain flat bulbs, turn them on their side and again, two and a half times that depth. Okay, that's brilliant. Steve, that links in with a query that you might the be able marines. to help with about marines. Yes, somebody has asked about planting marines because they, they always thought they should be shallow, but having seen um, a gardening program on television, they were advised to plant them several inches deep. So now they're a little bit confused. So I think the best person to ask would be you. What, what is the definitive answer? Uh, for planting nerines and tell us what a nerine is very quickly. A nerine is very much like a pink agapanthus except it's a bulb rather than a rhizome. Uh, the flower on stems, um, globular flower, uh, about anything from two to three foot high. In practical terms it's like a late flowering pink agapanthus. Uh, now if you plant a nerine bulb uh, several inches deep that is the last you'll ever see of it because it'll just rot underground. Uh, nerines and the related amarines should always be planted with the necks of the bulbs out of the compost or soil. You can plant them in either in patio pots or your garden. In the garden, we find that they're hardy down to minus 10, even with the necks exposed. Uh, in patio pots, we do treat them like an evergreen agapanthus, some protection in winter but the nose of the bulb must be exposed, otherwise it's a non-starter. They like plenty of sunshine and a well-drained soil or a well-drained compost. And the longer you leave them to clump up, the better they become. And when would you plant nerines? When would you, what, what time of the year, Steve? We sort of plant nerines from about mid to late spring, and that gives them uh, plenty of time to get established for flowering the same year. We only sell the grade one bulbs, which have got flowers already coming in them. And what people don't realize is the nerine bulb is pretty much like uh, dropping a pebble on a pond as it grows from the basal plate. Um, the flower you see this autumn, it's also got two more flowers within the leaves in the bulb. Uh, what are going to flower next year. It was commonly thought they had two bulbs, uh, two flowers in the stem, but it's now thought there's three. Whereas the agapanthus just put the flower bud in autumn for flowering the following season. Okay, that's great advice there. Uh, well, we are almost out of time. We have literally only got a couple of minutes left. So I want to come to each of you in turn. So it's got to be a really quick, short, sharp tip to on your specialist plant that you want to get out there, a message to everybody watching. So, Alec, can we start with you? Just a very quick tip. Quick tip with peonies, um, be bold, be brave and have a go. They're not as delicate as they look. They're really, really hardy <coughs> and tough. And there's just three things to remember with herbaceous peonies. 
plant them at the correct depth, and that's just one or two inches below the surface. Plant them in any soil will do really, as long as it's free draining and in any position, as long as it's full sun or part shade and a little bit of shelter. And they're dead easy and they'll last for decades. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob, a quick tip from you. Hunting gladiolas now in uh, early May will give a wonderful range of colour right throughout August and September. But the most important fact is they need to be planted in full sun and they need plenty of water close to the time of flowering. So don't be afraid, plant them in full sun, plenty of water as soon as you see the flower bud come in and you'll have vases and vases of flowers to put in their mansions. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Matt, quick tip from you, if we can, please. Um, I suppose I have to say something about a Venus flytrap, I think. You must always use rainwater. Don't keep making them close, the traps close. I know it's tempting. And always remove the flowers from them. Nice sunny position, standing in rainwater, remove the flowers. There's a good tip for those. Okay, excellent. Vicky Fox, from you. Um, the flowers on the hoopers are fantastic. Keep them on there. The bees love them. Uh, they get more flowers if you feed them uh, about once, once a fortnight, once a month, uh, with a low um, nitrate feed, which is this is hooper feed here, available on our website. And uh, also deadhead the flowers by going all the way down the stem. Give it a little tweak at the bottom as that damages the plant slightly. It knows it's gone and it wants to replace it with more. Good tip. Right, Steve. A uh, quick tip. Uh, split and repot agapanthus now, any time from mid-March to mid-April. Uh, so you're just in time this year. Start feeding, most important, a good high potash feed every fortnight from sort of late spring to late September. Uh, every fortnight, you can get specialist feed from us something for the garden, and for lots and lots of information. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. That's our book, <laughs> which makes an excellent present for people who've got everything. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well done, Steve. Thank you very much. An interesting forward in there as well, I do believe. And, and Lynn. Excellent. <laughs> Lynn, um, finally, can we have your tip? I would say now's a good time to pot up streptocarpus if you've had them for more than a year, just into a slightly larger pot, into a good houseplant compost. And once they're growing and you can see roots starting to appear from underneath the, the drainage holes of the pot, then start feeding, feed a high potash feed and your plant will flower all summer, uh, right and through to middle of the autumn um, and just keep deadheading them Put them on an east or west windowsill and they will love it. Lovely. That's great. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, everybody, for watching the virtual flower show. There are other things happening, of course. And please, please do keep supporting our specialist growers and exhibitors. We've got some fantastic growers in the UK and we need to hang on to that expertise. So they've all got websites that you can check and look at. So thank you very much and have a good gardening year. Goodbye. And thank you, everybody.